right, so after looking at some of the drawbacks and limitations of the GDP calculation, I feel like we should talk about CPI a little bit. We did some of this in class, but just as kind of a refresher since you have a test coming up. CPI does measure changes in prices over time for a wide variety of goods and services that many people purchase in a given country. Now, again, that's a nice quantitative measure. It only gets us so far. So what are some of the potential problems with the CPI? First issue is the market basket composition. Now, economists do change over time what goods are in the market basket. There are some products that are purchased today that didn't exist 10 years ago. There are some products that were really popular 10, 20 years ago that have zero market today. So as buying patterns change, as spending habits change, as availability of different products and services it are adjusted in the economy, we see that the market basket can become irrelevant. Now, this is not changed very often. So what you might get is a situation where the market basket is outdated and it's not adjusted very quickly to reflect your average consumer's spending habits. The next problem is the relevance of the base year. A base year is a year that when the economy is very stable, that's what they want to go on to judge where we are today with inflation. But as we get farther and farther away from the base year, it may become less and less relevant. So again, you get a lag time between when it's recognized as being an issue and when an official adjustment is finally made. Lag just means there's some gap there between recognizing the problem and actually doing something about it. And another issue is the relevance to a given consumer. How does this market basket and its calculations based on the base year actually, you know, how, what does this have to do with me, for example? What does this have to do with you? How does this relate to the spending of your next door neighbor? Well, the problem is that while we look at the market basket for, you know, your, your, your average person or, you know, Bob, the theoretical consumer, that's not necessarily any actual real person in the United States. So, it's an abstraction. So what does that mean, an abstraction? In macroeconomics, we have a lot of models that are built on the average across the board what happens with the economy. The model is based on the behavior. The, ba the behavior is not based on the model. So what does that give us? It gives us kind of an overall view, but can we pinpoint the one person that that actually relates to? Does it relate to everyone equally? No, it doesn't. For some people, for example, some goods have a more inelastic demand than others, like gasoline. I'm going to do this really fast because the, the camera's dying. All right. Looking at the difference between potential GDP and actual GDP, this ties into um, Oaken's Law, or Oaken's Law, I've heard it pronounced both ways, don't know which one is right. If we graph potential GDP, this is if the economy is at its full rate of unemployment or its natural rate of unemployment. So in the US, let's say that's about 5%, it's a convenient benchmark number. If we graph actual GDP, and it is under potential, then that means we have some resources that are unemployed in the country. Ockham's Law says for every 1%, your unemployment is higher than the natural rate, you get a 2% GDP gap. So let's say, for example, if we're talking about the United States today, that we are about 5% higher unemployment than natural. That 
means that we have a 10% negative GDP gap. That means we are going to be approximately 10% lower than our potential GDP with 5% extra people being unemployed. That's a number that you're going to need to be familiar with. Just keep in mind, it's like a 1 to 2 ratio. 